So good to have you join us on this Friday. Hello and welcome to Business Daily. I'm Lee ji in Seoul. We have a lot lined up for you today, so let's get started with a look at today's highlights. Who will be the final winner? Korea Customs Service is set to announce the lucky recipients of new duty-free operating licenses this Saturday. And what's making headlines in global business news this week? China's Singles Day event ends up seeing record-breaking success, with Alibaba raking in over $14 billion in sales over just 24 hours, while commodities markets are feeling the pressure from El Nino. But first, Korea's Finance Minister Choi Kyung-hwan has said that if the National Assembly passes the National Budget Bill for next year, it can potentially raise Korea's GDP growth by seven-tenths of a percentage point. Chairing a fiscal strategy meeting on Friday, the top economic policymakers said the $332 billion budget plan outlines measures that are essential to economic recovery. They include plans to create more jobs for young people, supporting future food industries, and strengthening assistance for small business owners and the underprivileged. Che urged members of parliament to swiftly approve the budget plan by the legal deadline of December 2nd, saying if so, the government will make preparations to maximize results by executing the funds early next year. Seoul's current growth forecast for 2016 is 3.3 percent, revised down from its previous 3.5 percent. Now, the battle among Korean conglomerates to bag new duty-free licenses is about to come to an end, as Korea Customs Service is set to carry out a last review before announcing its final decision on Saturday. Our Kim min -ji looks into the final round of Korea's duty-free war. Who will it be? Korea's customs agency says it will announce the recipients of duty-free operating licenses on Saturday after a strict closed-door evaluation over the next two days. Four conglomerates, Lotte Group, SK Group, Shinsegae and Dusan Group, are vying to be granted licenses to operate duty-free stores in three locations in Seoul, set to expire this year. Two companies, retail giant Shinsegae and fashion group Hyungji, are competing for one location in Korea's southern port city of Busan. On the first day, the panel will review documents submitted by the companies before presentations by the competitors the following day. The companies will be assessed on various factors such as management capabilities, financial soundness and contribution to society. There has been intense competition for duty-free licenses in Korea as the business has become a huge source of profit. In 2014, six duty-free stores in Seoul posted combined sales of nearly 4 billion U.S. dollars. And the competitors are all eager to get in on the action. However, some critics say the heat of competition raises eyebrows as it can result in unrealistic pledges and targets, insisting that companies should be more focused on providing differentiated strategies for global competitiveness. Kim min -ji, Business Daily. Imported diesel car sales here in Korea hit a record low last month, stemming from Volkswagen's latest diesel emissions rigging scandal. Korea Automobile Importers and Distributors Association revealed Friday that the number of newly registered imported diesel motor vehicles was a little over 11,000, the lowest since October last year. It was no surprise that sales of Volkswagen and Audi vehicles dropped after the German automaker's diesel emissions fraud was revealed in September. There were only 947 newly registered Volkswagen cars last month, down 2,000, a third from the previous month. All eyes and ears are on the U.S. Fed Reserve as it deliberates on whether to raise rates for the first time in nearly a decade. More people are offering their opinion as the big meeting approaches in mid-December, but Fed Chief Jenna Yellen is keeping her stance to herself. Our Sun Jung-in has this report. 
The International Monetary Fund has suggested the U.S. Federal Reserve take a more cautious approach before deciding to raise interest rates. In a report, the IMF said the Federal Open Market Committee should delay a rate hike until they see clear signs of inflation rising toward its 2% target. Citing prolonged global financial uncertainties, the report expressed concerns a rate increase could cause financial volatility and abrupt changes in emerging market capital flows. Fed Chair Janet Yellen, who has been calling for a gradual increase, showed a rather neutral stance this time. Speaking at a Fed board conference in Washington on Thursday, Yellen did not address the current policy outlook. She only stressed that policymakers must be mindful of the effects that post-crisis financial regulations can have on the global economy. It's crucial to understand the effect of regulations and possible changes in financial intermediation on monetary policy implementation and transmission. But some senior Fed officials are shifting toward possible liftoff. Regional Fed presidents James Bullard and Jeffrey Lacker said the central bank no longer needed to keep rates near zero as U.S. inflation was near the Fed's goal. Bullard predicted a strong labor market with the unemployment rate dropping to the 4 percent range. Other global economists are growing more confident the Fed will start upping the rate next month. A poll by the Wall Street Journal found that more than 90 percent of economists believe a hike will be announced at the Fed's December policy meeting. Sun jung in Business Daily. The Milan Expo attracted some 20 million visitors from around the world during its five-month run. And Korea took part in it as well, and the country's signature dishes were quite popular among visitors there. So much so that experts believe the long-term economic benefits for Korea could top hundreds of millions of dollars. Our Oh Soo-young tells us more. Italians are known for their hearty dishes with plenty of olive oil, tomatoes and mixed herbs. But in Milan, the country's bustling fashion capital, more and more people are enjoying Korean cuisine. From May to October, Korea showcased its signature dishes at this year's Milan Expo and was among the 145 countries that participated under the theme Feeding the Planet, Energy for Life. During the six-month exposition, the Korea Pavilion welcomed roughly 2.3 million guests, eager to explore Korean gastronomy and around 190,000 have visited the restaurant inside the pavilion to taste the country's best dishes such as bibimbap, a spicy mix of rice, meat and vegetables, and tapte, stir-fried sweet potato noodles with strips of lean meat and vegetables flavoured with soy sauce. I chose to try tapte because it's similar to pasta. I like it because the flavour isn't strong, but it's slightly spicy. The restaurant has generated sales revenue of over 3.7 million US dollars. And industry experts say the Korea Pavilion will continue to make substantial economic impact in the next 10 years, worth over 430 million dollars. The economic benefits will amount to around $440 million, but the cultural impact of tourism, the arts, tradition and history will be much more substantial. In fact, the Milan Expo has not only attracted food lovers, it's boosted Korea's image. After dropping by the pavilion, the number of people expressing interest in purchasing Korean products doubled to 75%. While those interested in visiting Korea also doubled to 77 percent. Oh Soo-young, Business Daily. It's Friday, and that means it's time to look through some of the global business headlines from this week. And for that, we're now joined by our Eunice Kim in the studio. Hi, Eunice. Hi, Jian. Okay, so the past couple of weeks, we've touched upon China's shift from an investment-propped economy to mm -hmm. a consumer-driven economy. That's and right. And this week, we saw a showdown of sorts mm -hmm. displaying China's buying power. You're absolutely right. If there was a party for the Chinese consumer power, this mm -hmm. was it. We're, of course, talking about Alibaba single day online shopathon that smashed all previous records. Now what could this annual event tell us about China's private consumption shift? Take a look. 
$14.3 billion, $2.6 billion greater than Laos's GDP last year. It's how much Alibaba says shoppers spent on its online platform following the kickoff for its Singles Day Bonanza. Jack Ma's four-hour event featured 007 agent Daniel Craig and American Idol star Adam Lambert before shoppers in China and beyond snapped up cutthroat deals among a list of vendors that included Burberry, Uniqlo and Estee Lauder. Brands that were inaccessible to the Chinese on their home turf were now directly appealing to them on cyberspace. As Alibaba said the day's best sellers were baby and nutritional products and Nike Kicks. Their prices slashed by nearly 50 percent. The e-commerce company, which claims 80 percent of China's online shopping market, said this event wasn't just about China. It said sellers and buyers came from 232 unique countries. And over the 24-hour shopathon, Alibaba said its payment service, Alipay, handled 710 million transactions. At its peak, that number coming to 86,000 payments per second. Uh, yes, the Chinese economy has been slowing, but um, the number of people shopping online has been increasing uh, at, a, at a much faster rate. And also, um, the number of products that are available online has been increasing uh, every year. It's a space that the Chinese government is optimistic about. Retail sales as a whole has been on a rebound. China's National Bureau of Statistics said this week sales of consumer goods in October was up 11 percent, its widest increase this year, vis-à-vis -vis industrial output, which rose 5.6 percent, tying with its March reading, the weakest since the financial crisis of 2008. The figure was disappointing for analysts when considering central government efforts to prop up the sector this year that includes hundreds of greenlit infrastructure projects and six interest rate cuts. And as demand for production wobbles along, it remains to be seen how long it will take for Chinese private consumption to fill the growing void. So retail sales are going strong, but I guess now the question is, will this be enough to help push China to achieve its growth target? Right, and it was the only bright spot really in the data dump that we saw out of Beijing this week. Some economists would even venture to say that it's China's only bright spot right now as exports were down for a fourth straight month and factories also down for their 44th consecutive month. But retail, or private consumption, is an area that's seen to have enormous potential still. Beijing last month put into effect a 10 percent tax cut on smaller cars that helped boost sales to its biggest increase this year. But given the size of the country as well, online purchases is where companies are putting their money on when it comes to China and companies like Alibaba are going one step further and zoning in on mobile sales, which was, of course, quite present in this last shopathon, making up for just under 69 percent of sales, according to Alibaba. Wow. So that's seven out of 10 transactions that were made through mobile phone or yeah, tablet. Pretty right. remarkable. Indeed, indeed. OK, well, do we know how much of overall retail sales, uh, online sales account for? Well, according to one economist cited by the New York Times, that number is about 10 percent. 10 percent of uh, on, uh, online sales make up for the greater retail pie. But to give you a sense of what that means in terms of the bottom line, last year, online purchases by Chinese shoppers rang in at just under 2,800 billion yuan. That's 450 billion U.S. dollars and a near 50 percent increase from the year before. So the growth Growth is there, with more than half of China's population now living in cities and 7 out of 10 Chinese smartphone users saying they've made an anywhere, anytime purchase on their smartphone. This can be good news for companies ready to tap into a market nearly 1 billion strong. Jim. I have to agree with those shoppers. It's so much more convenient to make those purchases with your mobile phone. Anywhere, anytime, right? I know. Yeah. All right, we'll leave that there. What else made headlines this week? Well, we're going to take a look at some commodity news today. First, we'll begin with gold. According to the World Gold Council on Thursday, demand for 
gold was at its highest in two years in the third quarter. It said overall demand was up 8% year-on-year, while purchases of bars and coins was up by a third. This comes as the cost of spot gold in July had dropped to a five-year low. Taking advantage of the cheaper prices were buyers from China, Europe and the U.S., where investors snatched up three times more bars and coins, hauling away 33 tons worth. Gold jewelry was also a hot seller in India in time for the annual Diwali holiday season, but an outflow was spotted in bullion-backed exchange-traded funds. Gold prices continue their downward slope, falling for a 12th session out of 13 on this Friday on rising hopes that a U.S. interest rate liftoff will happen next month. And finally, weather agencies are warning of a significant El Nino season this year. And the prices of agricultural commodities are already climbing. Over the past three months, the price of sugar hiked up 33 percent. Dairy surged by 55 percent and palm oil rose by 13.3 percent, according to The Wall Street Journal. Australia's Bureau of Meteorology and said ocean and atmosphere indicators were comparable to the damaging years of 1997 to 1998 and 1982 to 1983. Japan's Weather Bureau said October logged the warmest ocean temperatures on record for that month since 1950. Wow, and I think it's unusually warm for November here in Korea too. That's right, and other places are unusually cooler and mm -hmm. drier as well. Okay, thank you so much for coming in today, Eunice. You bet. And that wraps it up for today and this week. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll be back next week with more, so don't forget to tune in then. Have a great weekend, everyone.